E aproveitando uh, para chamar o nosso último uh, palestrante da, da manhã, que também vai falar sobre o ensino de ciências e sobre como é possível levar abordagens modernas para o ensino de ciências, mesmo em escolas, uh, em, em regiões de alto risco, em, em comunidades de baixa renda e tudo mais. E, para falar sobre isso, eu tenho a, a honra o prazer de chamar aqui o Brian Brown. O Brian Brown é professor livre docente e vice-diretor da Escola de Educação da Universidade de Stanford, a sua pesquisa tem como foco principal o ensino de ciências e a formação de professores para o ensino de ciências, e ele examina questões como estresse estudantil, cultura e linguagem no ensino de ciências. O seu trabalho empírico examina como o ensino tradicional de ciências aliena estudantes de baixa renda em, centro, em grandes centros urbanos, e também inclui fatores que levam o acesso ao ensino superior nessas mesmas comunidades de baixa renda, explorando elementos como etnia, linguagem e cultura. Então, é com grande prazer e honra que eu chamo aqui Brian Brown. I'm waiting for my slides. These are not my slides, but they're beautiful slides. <laughs> well, while we wait for slides, I have a simple idea I want to share. And the, the, the idea is that if we teach in the way that learning happens, that the students who we have will, will achieve regardless of our teaching. It's, it's learning that never fails. Students succeed when teachers teach in the way that learning happens. So at, as a big idea to share, I thought I would start by sharing what I learned from uh, Google Translate, which is my favorite application. Uh, I, I travel the country in the United States, and I, I talk to people about how learning is a necessity. When learning is a necessity, people can't help but to learn. So I want to share a few phrases that I've learned. Paso uh, ter utensilos. Gaster de comprar comida para vayer. I said that wrong. <laughs> My favorite. Ponde un tino un comperto. I lost my jacket, and so uh, comperto, am I saying that right? Coberto, right, very important phrase to get right. My favorite, my daughter's favorite question. Uh, Pipoca meo hermano. She was asking for popcorn, my brother, and that was a, a phrase that she, she mastered. Another one, uacho que pede arroz branco. My son asked for white rice instead of fried rice. Oi como va, that, that one worked. Another important question, oi fica o banheiro? <laughs> and of course, abrigado pela ajuda, right? So if, if learning works by necessity, the only phrases that we'll ever remember in Portuguese are those that are necessary phrases. All right, and I think I've stalled enough. So the, the title of the talk is Science Education for Our Current Future. And just to clarify, what that means is that what we do today is the most predictive force for our future. And so if we think forward, the question is, what are we doing today to produce the changes that we desire? Right? So I want to start with the paradox of science education. Uh, in science education, we are charged to do something that you never ask English teachers to do. We ask our science educators to do two things simultaneously. First, produce the next generation of scientists. Second, produce a citizen, uh, a, a, a population of citizens that are skilled in understanding best principles in science. When do you hear English teachers asked to produce the greatest novelists yet to come? 
We rarely ask our historians to produce the next generation of world-class historians. And there is an embedded assumption that our economic right, that our societal good are deeply connected to how well we teach science. Let me give you two brief examples. Paulo mentioned them earlier. In the United States, our failure to teach the process or the epistemic nature of science has led to two fundamental failings. And I'll give you case number one. Currently, there is a debate about whether or not climate change is a real human-produced phenomenon. Right? If science is charged with producing, number one, scientists, and number two, a population of people who understand science, our failure to provide people the capability to interpret data and make an informed decision is reflective of our poor job in teaching science. A second, more localized debate is around vaccinations and its impact on, on the emergence of autism. It is a correlational relationship between the rise of, of, of autism in the US and the assumed association with vaccines. But the voices of one researcher who recanted his work versus a body of research that says that uh, vaccines do not produce autism are debated and debated as if the two forces are equal. The challenge and failure is a failure to produce the population of citizens who can adequately interpret data and make informed decisions, right? So why does that matter, right? Where we are, where I live in California, there's a growing uh, presence of measles, diseases that were fundamentally erased from the US population years ago. But because of our citizens' inability to truly understand how to make these scientific decisions, right, there is a, a, an emergence of disease. So why is that important? Well, I'm gonna argue today that learning has not changed, but the human brain is adapting to its resources, right? And as such, I'm gonna argue that in a beautiful place like Brazil, one of the fundamental things that you should do is think about how do you teach and prepare teachers to prepare students for a contemporary age? I'm gonna make a couple points here moving forward. So one of the challenges and one of the things that I wanna really challenge people to think about is that science is assumed to be the property of the intellectual elite that only though the most intelligent people, only the elite individuals should be involved in science. That paradigm has to shift. When I was in school, we had things called weeder classes. So weeder classes were courses designed to rid the science majors of the weakest students. So you think about it. If I'm in a class and only a tenth of the students are, are able to proceed, and that is the group that we're going to focus on. Is it a failure of the students or the failure of the teacher? Don't answer that question. <laughs> right? I think we, we all know the answer. It is a failure of mentality that science should be a resource for all. So science has a responsibility to, to lead, and it's assumed to be an economic driver. I'll, I'll leave that, that argument to my, uh, my economic colleagues who can make that an argument. I want to make a point here. Uh, <laughs> There's an article in Nature recently that argues that in the United States, the growth of science as a fundamental field has produced an economic divide between those who are participants in the science economy and those who are not. Um, there is um, an article, this is from the state of Washington in the United States of America. It says, when federal budget funds scientific research, it's economic the economy benefits. There's another argument that states should invest in science. We go to countries like Singapore. In Singapore, they're making an argument that investment in science research leads to a better population, but their argument is a little bit more nuanced. It argues, one, that financial infrastructure leads to a healthier society, and two, that people make better decisions. There's less likely to engage in behaviors that are uninformed if they are rich in scientific understanding. And finally, in the country of Ghana is that the government is to invest 1% of its gross domestic product into science and innovation. And so Paulo mentioned that there is a revolution. Is I, I've been a science educator for nearly 20 years, and I finally don't have to explain what I do for a living. People understand that science education is important, right? all of a sudden. So th with this assumption, uh, it is important to think about what happens. What are the outcomes? So one of the biggest arguments is that a healthy science education produces a, a wealth of sustainability of disposable products. And so here's what I want, I'll, I'll hope to make clear. So a car, unfortunately, is a disposable product. Cell phones are 
unfortunately, disposable products, right? Transportation systems, although they, they last a long time, they're ultimately disposable products and medicine. These are economic drivers um, of, of industry in many countries, right? The argument is that if we produce uh, these things in our society, that we will continue to see economic growth. So here's, here's the biggest issue for me, is with the development of sustainable, disposable products, we've changed human learning. So this is what my children look like, the children that I interact with. I had an opportunity to walk around Sao Paulo, and guess what? The children here look this same way. Faces to computers, <coughs> phones in pockets. What that says to me is that although the human brain does not change, right, is that the things that shape our thinking do. Let me give you an example. I'm going the wrong way. Does anybody remember these devices? Uh, lots of fun. It, it, it was a great aesthetic feeling to being able to dial someone this way. So there was a time when if you were to ask me, what is Paolo's phone number, that I can give you that number immediately. Without hesitation, I remembered it clearly. So for some reason, we do not remember people's phone numbers anymore. The question is why? I have, I have to say, this is a very difficult talk to me. I come from the African-American tradition of call and response. And so when I ask questions, I generally want a response. <laughs> so this is quite difficult, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. So to answer the question, well, so what happened? I, I feel much better now. Thank you, thank you. So what happened to our capacity to remember phone numbers and addresses? Automatic dialing. And when I ask people this, I say, well, what is your friend's address? You surely remember your friend's addresses, right? Uh, it's in the phone as well. So it's in the GPS. So, so the deep GPS which did not emerge as a fundamental, easy to have device until seven or eight years ago. Has, has it, did they embed a secret software to erase our memory? I hope not. So what, what that says, and remember the title of the talk is, is, is Science Education for the Contemporary Future, is in the contemporary, necessity drives learning. Banajero, is that how you say it? The only word that I really need for a couple of days, right? I need to, to, to be able to understand that necessity drives understanding. So in two ways, the science education of today does not teach in the way that learning happens. And we all know it. If I wanted to learn Portuguese, which I do wish I'd learned Portuguese, what would you have me do? Simple question. I would need to come to Brazil and speak horrible Portuguese for several months. There is something about the task of needing to do it that produces understanding. We all understand this, but when you go into a classroom, how often do students give an opportunity to offer horrible explanations of science ideas in the pathway towards fundamental understanding? Right. So if brains have not changed, meaning that we have not lost information. What has changed is generating the necessity to use the knowledge that we have. So until you ask me, well, what is that phone number? It is the question that produces the understanding. So teaching, therefore, must reflect a fundamental understanding of how learning works. So you can spend years reading. I'm an educational psychologist by training and also a linguist. And so merging these two fields has, has brought me somewhere. It's that first is that knowledge is constructed socially, that collectively we come to build understandings together. But knowledge is situated in students' context. And here's what I mean by that, is that in the culture that the students live, whatever knowledge is most valuable is the knowledge that they will have at the greatest amounts. I often go to places. I work in urban contexts in the United States, places like Detroit and Chicago and Oakland and Los Angeles. There's an assumption that the kids in these places do not know much. That they're not intelligent. But we're asking the wrong questions. If we ask them about video games, they have depths of information. If we ask them about athletics, they can tell you quite a bit. If you ask them about producing music and the equipment involved in producing music, they can speak for hours on end. The question is, expertise lives in the culture. But if you don't understand the culture, then the expertise of the children becomes invisible. Language. Language operates on a similar 
context. When you enter into a chemistry class, there's one thing that you should not know. And, and, and here's, here's, a, here's a trick question. What is the thing that I don't expect you to know when you arrive in a chemistry class? Can someone offer that answer for me? Chemistry. Otherwise, why would I be there? But the way that we teach is we ask students about chemistry ideas. We expect them to communicate the chemistry ideas that we are to teach them using the language of chemistry. So again, if we don't understand the language of the communities where the people are participants, we will not understand their genius. And, and finally, experience. Is that the experiences we have most produce the knowledge that we find valuable. So there was discussions of maker spaces. So the scientific things that we make in communities are the places where our scientific knowledge will be greatest. So if a community is a community where there's a great number of skateboarders, uh, I've been impressed by the graffiti and, and skateboarders in the city of Sao Paulo, I would assume that there's a great knowledge of how ball bearings work in this community. The reason why is because experience drives the necessity of knowledge. And I want to go back to the premise of the talk before we transition into research. The premise is that if we do not teach in the way that learning works, then we have a false expectation that young people should be able to learn and learn well. So the first point, and this is, I guess, the thing that I bring to the discussion that hasn't been addressed yet, is that culture and cognition work together. Is we don't think outside of the culture in which we live. But we, as teachers, must learn to teach in the context of the students. Now, in the United States, it's a huge crisis because we have very few teachers who come from the communities in which they tend to teach. Let me say that differently. In urban context, teachers tend to teach in communities like their own. But in urban schools, the teachers who teach in the most impoverished communities do not come from the cultures in which their students live. As such, the cultural knowledge that the students bring to the academic environment is often invisible. So learning in a new era requires greater interpretation and integration of knowledge. So here, here's what I mean. It's not knowledge that is impressive these days. If, you, if I were to ask you, what is the substance on the outer layer of a virus? Don't answer that question. Anyone can look it up and say, well, it is a capsid. It is made of protein. It protects the DNA in the virus. It is almost irrelevant because the knowledge is so accessible. What is more, most important is if you Google that information, can you tell me why that is true? Did you, did you believe that? I just told you something. That the name of the outer substance is called a, a capsule. Is that accurate? Don't believe a college professor. I am a, not a, a person to believe. Right? The capacity of an individual now to interpret information is far more significant and valuable than the actual information itself. My, one of my uh, academic mentors at Stanford University, Rich Shavelson, he talked about uh, there's a hierarchy of, of knowledge types, and they're, they're different. So declarative knowledge is one type of knowledge. And that is to say that when we can make a statement about something, we can name it, that is a type of knowledge. So to say, a capsid is the outer layer of a virus. That is declarative knowledge. There's procedural knowledge. And that is the knowledge that one needs in order to do something. So if I can build a, an electric scooter, I may not understand the philosophy or the ideologies behind all of the, the parts of the motor. But if I can build it, that is a type of knowledge. And the third type, which is the type that we need moving forward, is epistemic knowledge. Is I understand why the ideas are what they are. I have an understanding of what's right and why the alternative is, is, is therefore not true. All right. So as we move forward, the information age has called for a science education that truly understands that it is not enough for us to just have declarative knowledge. We must have procedural knowledge. And we must also have epistemic knowledge. All right, so I say all of this to introduce the idea, how does this impact how we teach science? And so before we talk about teaching explicitly, I'm going to work backwards and talk, show you some research. So I am a researcher, so I have a burden of credibility, so I'm going to show you a few things. So the first is that this is a standard academic text in the United States. This is a high school text. And I want to just highlight some things for you. And I like to provide premise. And so here's the premise. Oops. The point of a text is to make what is unclear, clear. So this is an introduction of bacteria reproduction. And for those of you who forgot, it's a very simple process. 
A single-celled organism is going to split itself in half after, after duplicating its DNA. It's not complicated. But I want to take a, have you take a look at the two words that are circled, plasmid, bacteria, uh, conjugation. I want you to take a look at the images. Now, these are two images of the exact same thing. I want to remind you again that the very purpose of this is to make what is unclear clear. So what we've done is we've, in the description, uh, there's another academic term up top, which is binary fission. So for me to understand binary fission, I must then incorporate the idea of a plasmid. I must incorporate that idea of bacteria conjugation and understand the text on the bottom. If you look at underneath, oops. Thank you. Uh, un underneath the text on the right, it says bacteria use binary fission, a cell division. Um, I can't even read it, right? It, it's, it is utterly complicated. So here, here's the challenge. If we teach in a way that requires the acquisition of new language and new ideas simultaneously, we are fundamentally limiting how students come to understand ideas. So I want, I want to start by saying one of the challenges is when we teach, we must understand the principles of learning and ask ourselves, are we teaching in the way that learning works? So I want to take you to uh, an image of multimedia learning. I want to talk about multimedia learning as well. This comes from scholar Richard Mayer. And so the idea is that when we learn through devices, through computers, is that we have an input channel through multimedia, and that is words and pictures. And so in the words and pictures, we only have two input input channels for ourselves, the sensory memory, are ears and eyes. And that when, you, when we hear things, we're, all we're doing, whether or not it's a video or a simulation, is we're still looking at pictures and we are listening to sounds, however it's presented. I don't care if it's a virtual reality. If I put on virtual reality goggles, I'm still simply looking at a picture and experiencing audio. Where this becomes important is that we then incorporate or connect to the working memory, right? And so we then develop models based on what we experience, and that leads to prior knowledge. But I want to take you to a, a subtext here. Here's the subtext, is none of this is done in a void. So what we need to think about is how culture shapes these things. So if the images that I'm presented um, in the multimedia are connected to the culture that I exist in, the likelihood that I remember them is far greater. So let, let, me, let me step backwards for a moment. So we're developing now software that teaches students virtual reality. The, the challenge and mistake that developers are making is they're asking students, we want to take you and take you to uh, a community far away. We're going to take you to Egypt, and you can see the, the Great Pyramids. While that's effective, it's seeing the Great Pyramids once is far less effective than taking them into their local grocery store so they can see phenomena in a way that they've never seen it before for two reasons. Number one is if I use multimedia to introduce them to new words and images. For example, if I teach osmosis through taking students into a grocery store, I'm giving them images and sounds that they've already have a connection to. More importantly, if I teach them about the phenomena, I'm triggering long-term memory. So every time they return to that grocery store, we've reconnected them to the phenomena that they see regularly. So one of the failures of multimedia technology, its limitation, is its inability to connect to the culture in which students value. You told me that it is the punching of the phone numbers that we, we mentioned that is that because you never have to call anyone, you don't remember. So why would technology be any different? If I have to describe or experience things that I experience every day, the likelihood that I remember is greater. So where does that take us? It takes us to four studies. I'm going to introduce them as quickly as I can that make a simple argument is that if we teach students in ways that really taps into their culture, not only will they learn, but they'll experience greater understanding of phenomena that'll last longer. So I'm going to introduce you to four studies. The first is that a study about science, language, and cognition. What happens when we use students' language resources as a fundamental way to teach science? The second is about academic stress. So if we teach students and we focus on language, does language produce academic stress? The third is digital text and student learning. We use uh, new platforms, iPads, to embed images. We allowed students to, to teach, to, to be taught by texts that look like them and measure the impact of texts that actually reflected the student's culture. And last is language and teacher, teacher ideology. And this is most pertinent for you. How do we prepare teachers to understand student learning in ways that are most productive? 
So here's the big idea. Teaching does not always reflect uh, how, how language learning approaches. So I'll go quickly. There's a theoretical framework that guides all of our work. It's called the language identity dilemma. And here's the thing. If I introduce you to a new science idea, but I'm introducing this idea with science language. I make no affordance to the language that I'm using. So I introduce an idea like bacterial fission by talking about plasmids, plasma vectors, and fission. So I would start instruction that way. Right? We're arguing that two things happen. First, I don't understand. So there's a cognitive limiting factor. And secondly, I don't feel comfortable, is that this generates stress for students. Excuse me, I'm having trouble with the clicker. There we go. So in the failure to understand, there's two subtexts that are important for us to think about. The first is if I'm using academic language to teach and I make no affordances for student language, first, I produce a failure to understand. And secondly, if students are communicating in their own language, the language of their community, is they won't be understood. The teachers are often listening for science ideas to be communicated in science language. So this binary thinking, where the ideas can only be right if communicated in science language, makes what students know fundamentally un invisible to students. So we've studied this over the years. So uh, it's, the work has been picked up by scholars uh, in different places. So for example, uh, Rinke did a study uh, in uh, Switzerland arguing that if we teach science in simple everyday language, that science will learn it better. Uh, it's, the argument is that when we're learning science, we're essentially learning a second language. Uh, Olander argued that in teaching chemistry is that students who use both everyday language and the language of chemistry, they understood this information better. And, and all of this stuff is rooted in early studies from an, uh, a science educator named Arnold Ahrens who argued that if we teach the idea first, students would have a much better uh, position to learn the ideas. All right, so these are cognitive perspectives. There's also affective perspectives. And so in the United States, the work of Gilbert and Yerrick, they argue that for many students, if they have to use academic language and speak like a scientist, that they feel like they are no longer a part of their, their particular racial group. There's an argument by Signithia Fordham, was made in 1996, that for some students, using the, the language of the classroom causes them to immediately be seen as a cultural outsider, is that being a student and using academic talk means you cannot be seen as a part of the community. And finally, we did an argument, an article, and asked the students, well, what is difficult about science language? And they made the simple argument that I can't use the language of my community or no slang, is that if I communicate like a scientist, I am fundamentally an outsider in my own culture. All right, so to study this, we simple uh, quasi-experimental research study. What we did is we taught students in two ways. The group on top, you'll see uh, they were taught, the control group, they were taught with science words and academic words at the same time. They were our control group. The experimental group, what we did was gave them an everyday language first. We taught the idea as simply as we could, and then we taught science language to see if they produced a better outcome. Both groups are given a pretest. Uh, both groups are taught in the two different conditions, and both groups are given a post-test. So here's the research question. Does the use of complex science language impact student science learning? Here's an example of the two conditions. One of the challenges in doing experimental studies with teachers is that it requires all the teachers to teach the content exactly the same. To reduce the challenges in teacher fidelity, what we did was create two, two versions of the website so that we can make sure all students are being taught exactly the same and use software to teach the lesson. So if you take a look, it says oxygen, carbon dioxide, photons, and here's the everyday version. These are words that students use to describe the same phenomena. Good air, they're all li living things need for breathing, air that humans breathe out, and so the images were identical. The only difference was what language is used first, simple language or science language. What we found, if you take a look at the treatment group versus the control group, is in the difference between pre and post questions is that the treatment group students, those taught with science language, or simple language rather, uh, outperform those who are taught with explicitly using science language. And so we found an impact uh, for all items. If we asked the young people, to, if we taught them with simple language, they learned better and retained the information. We then asked them different types of questions, multiple choice questions, uh, we also have to have the right, have open-ended questions. And across all measures, what we found was that despite the, the type of question asked, that when we taught students with the language 
of their community first and then taught them the science language that they outperformed those who were taught with science language. There's a, a second study. The second study is about the affect. So what about how people feel in response to the way that they're being taught? So similar conditions, exactly the same. We taught one group using academic language, the other group using everyday language. And so uh, I want to make sure I get through this quickly. So does the use of complex language impact uh, how students learn? All right, with 70 students, and so this is different. How do you imp measure stress? And so in order to do this, what we did is we gave them psychological measures for, for stress or re reduced cognitive capacity, the Stroop or Flanker test. So for example, if the word green is written in, in green, you, you, you type the letter G, or for the Flanker test, you look at the centermost arrow. Or in this case, these are incongruent measures, meaning that the colors do not match. So where it says orange is written in green, so you would write green, and it, you'll see here that the center arrow is an opposite. So congruent measures, the color and the word matches. Incongruent measure, the arrows are in opposite directions. And so what we found was, again, similar pattern. Those who were taught with simple language had better operating cognitive capacity, is that they were able to answer the questions more quickly and were able to accur accurately answer these questions, even if the questions require more cognitive demand. And so these are the questions that were, that were incongruent. If you look at Frank, Frank Flanker, Congruent. Those are items where the question was asked, but the uh, the the words and the images did not match. All right. So we we measured this using age as a proxy too to make sure that we could assess, account for age. And what we found was that even if you took for account the age of the student, that this phenomenon played out as well. So in that sense. If we teach science in, in the way that we've been teaching science with no concern for academic language, number one, students don't learn well, and two, we produce a subtle impact of stress by taking no measure of how we teach. So in a new study, we, we try to reflect on the traditional studies. The old study in the 30s and 40s in uh, New York, um, <clears throat> and these studies were called the Clark Dahl studies. What the Clark Dahl studies were is they put dolls in front of uh, African-American children, and they asked them, which of the, these dolls is a smart doll? Which one of these is a pretty doll? And in that time, the response to that question was almost uniformly, students, uh, African-American students selected white dolls as the doll that was both smart uh, and, and, and most appropriate. So in using digital technology, the question that we were curious about is, what if the person teaching you looked like you? What if the person teach, teaching you in the digital media sounded like you? What would the impact be? So we did two studies. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce you to the first today. And so essentially, what we did is we, we had students create digital books, simply dragging and dropping materials into place. And we gave them the option between characters that were uh, phenotypically similar. So if you take a look at pictures on top, they would pick between one of those two images. Uh, if you like, look in the middle, uh, they're, they're picking between uh, images. So we tried to keep gender equitable and keep the images as, as identical as possible. And the outcome of these digital books, they drive their materials into place. And so what we found was almost uniformly, if you take a look, to look at uh, row two, when they're selecting photos, they selected images that look like them. So almost 90, uh, almost 100% selected the, uh, excuse me, almost 85% selected the African-American male character. And they, they if you look at the, row three, there was a, a toggling. They were attuned to gender. And so students selected themselves. So African-American women in this case would select women that reflected themselves. And African-American men would select themselves. The only difference would be in animated characters where they selected images that looked like Albert, Albert Einstein. So when the, anim, when the picture was a cartoon character, they were very attuned to the stereotype. Um, this played out. And what we asked them about was, why did you select these images? And one of the things they noted was, that there was a, a, an aesthetic, the way that they looked, and there was an authenticity to look that they value. And for the sake of time, I'll, I'm going to move on. But here's, here's the fundamental premise. In this new digital era, where digital media options are available for students to teach themselves, is having a, a, an individual that looks like you and sounds like you in the instructional materials has a powerful influence on how students can connect themselves to the discipline. And a final study, and I'm going to move to, to, to bigger topics here, is we, we, we looked at teacher's knowledge. And so here's, here's what we were looking at. There's a, the, the idea of pedagogical content knowledge is the idea that in, in order to teach 
a content, it is not enough just to know the content. I must understand how the curriculum works. I must understand what students are thinking. I need to know about assessment, and I need to understand teaching practices as well as the nature of science. So for us, there was one thing missing from pedagogical content knowledge, and that is an understanding of how language reflects culture and how language reflects cognition. So in a study of of teachers in Northern California, what we did was we created four conditions. And so I'm gonna explain them. As we had them write down, we had fake, fake answers. So some of them are correct answers written in wrong, with wrong science language. So the idea was right, but the language was wrong. Others, the idea was right and the idea had ac correct academic language. The other, the language was wrong, but the idea was correct. So we, we switched correctness of idea and correctness of language to see if the teachers interpreted it in, in, in different ways, to see if could they hear the brilliance of their students when the language did not match their expectation. And what we found was that in many cases, the teachers heard the concepts, and they talked about the concepts, and they could recognize the concepts, uh, and some talked about language, but very few talked about the connection between the language and the concepts. And so what, what does that mean? And so I'm going to flip through this. Uh, the, here's what it means. Is for many of the students, the teachers in our study, is they operated in a binary framework. That is, the idea was either right or it was wrong. The language was either right or it was wrong. Others operated in what we call a spectrum framework. And so when they viewed the answer of the student, they said the part of this answer is correct, either the language or the concept. And some even looked at the concept and divided it into subcategories. But the big idea was that in preparing teachers, we need to go beyond the understanding of the phenomena towards an understanding where teachers are prepared to hear ideas beyond a simple binary right and wrong. So what does that mean for science education as we move forward? So in the United States, we've implemented what's called the new generation science standards. And the, the idea is that we want to erase false divides between concepts. And so chemistry, biology, and physics the, the, the divides that provide the, the definitions of those terms are false divides. Science is the understanding of real world phenomena and is often an integration between physics and biology and chemistry as well. So in the United States, we've, we've adopted this approach for, for a few reasons. First, practices. We, 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 are, we are behind in engineering at the K through 12 level because there's only one, one or two states, I know Massachusetts being one of those in the United States, that teaches engineering and through a K through 12 program. So engineering is only referenced as an external process. It's not a fundamental standard. We don't assess it. And so we don't value engineering, even though engineering is assumed to be one of our greatest economic outcomes. So with this new approach, the argument is that we want to integrate engineering into how we teach science fundamentally and cross-cutting themes. And this is something that you, you may think about. But cross-cutting themes is that there are some things that are so inherent to science that they should not be divided by subcategory. All right. And so this is a big error, and this is why I think the NGSS in some ways is doomed to fail in our country, is that this is what teachers receive. This is a very simple and easy read document, uh, cue the sarcasm. <laughs> They've offered the most confusing way to do a difficult task. So the, the task is we want you to teach science that also has principles of engineering. We want you to teach science that also has principles of other disciplines, whether it be chemistry or physics. And this is, this is what they've, they've been given. So what I, I want to I close, uh, and I want to let you know that we were not able to add subtitles. And so I want to show you some of the things that we do in, in, in teaching. So if the idea is that learning does not, teaching does not happen in ways that learning works, the question is, how do we prepare teachers to teach in the way that learning works? And so the first thing is to, we, we start by saying, never teach void of context. If context drives necessity, so I told you before that if I have to learn it, I will learn it. If I see it often, I'll understand it often. So we never teach science ideas void of context. So we teach our teachers from the day that they arrive at our university that you're going to start by relearning concepts in the context in which your students might encounter them. So for example, if the topic is osmosis, I might start by saying, well, where do students experience osmosis? That is the most important first question to ask. So I may say, well, when they spray, anybody seen them spray vegetables at the grocery store before? The answer is osmosis. Has anyone eaten popcorn and got thirsty after eating popcorn? Again, the answer is osmosis, right? And so 
our students must relearn the concept in the context on which it lives. And we have an exercise to teach them that that is called the 20 second story. Uh, so I'm going to show you a brief example of how that plays out in our training process. Ellen loved the story of Finding Nemo. Father and son get separated. Son makes new friends in a fish tank. Father goes on an epic journey to save his only child. And following the Disney way of life, everyone ends up living happily ever after. But what if there was some dark twist lurking in the shadow of the story? What if the dentist who found our tiny orange friend actually gave Nemo to his crazy niece, Darla. She doesn't know about marine life, and instead of putting Nemo into a new and friendly saltwater fish tank, she put Nemo into a freshwater fish bowl. Would it really matter? Saltwater, freshwater, I mean, it's all water, right? Would everything end up happily ever after for our little lost clownfish, Nemo? No, no way. So what gives? Why can't you put a saltwater fish into a freshwater tank? Well, fish that live in the ocean, like our little friend Nemo, are happy campers when they're surrounded by water. There's salt inside Nemo's body and outside Nemo's body. And nature likes everything to be balanced. And this is exactly what happens for saltwater fish when they're in a saltwater environment. Because again, there's salt on both sides of Nemo's skin. But when you put a fish like Nemo into fresh water, the conditions around him change. Now, unlike his happy home in the ocean, Nemo has more salt in his body than the fresh water around him. Nature hates that there's more salt on the inside than on the outside and wants to balance this out. Now, if we could look through a microscope at Nemo's body, we would see that there's tiny openings in his skin kind of like doorways. Now, the salt molecules inside Nemo's body are way too big to fit through these tiny doorways. But, water molecules are super small and fit perfectly through them. Only water can move easily in and out of a fish's body. Nature wants everything to even out, and the only way you can balance this is for water to start pouring into Nemo's body. Well, Nemo has so much salt compared to the fresh water surrounding him that the water just keeps coming in his body. With this effect, Nemo may as well have been a blowfish instead of a clownfish because he will swell up like a balloon. Eventually, he'll swell up so much that his cells will start to burst until finally, he goes belly up. Poor Nemo. Doesn't really make for a very good Disney ending. This process of water flowing through these tiny doorways is called osmosis, and it's an amazing phenomenon. Don't put Nemo into a freshwater tank. He's a saltwater fish and needs to be surrounded by salt. The most important tip for our fishy friends out there, stay on osmosis' good side. So I want to point to a couple things that might not be visible. The first is you, you did not hear the word random kinetic motion. You did not hear the word uh, hypotonicity. You did not hear the word hypertonicity. You did not hear the word semipermeable membrane. What, what you heard was a simple and clear story of the phenomenon in the context in which the kids might experience it again. So we start our teacher education program by helping our students understand that when we teach science in context, it can necessitate learning. A, a couple of other things we teach is assessment. The power of assessment is the greatest tool. Number one, if we pre-assess, I want to start my lesson by understanding what you know and where the context of instruction lives. The, this is not a random selection. She found out a movie that the students loved. This student found out that students had fish at home, and that's why that decision was made. Uh, informative assessment. We must provide students repetitive opportunities for explanation. Until I understand, right, I, excuse me, until I can explain it, I won't know whether or not I know it or not. The power of explanation is it's a diagnostic tool. It produces one, a confidence of understanding, or two, a recognition of what I need to know. 
And so the, the challenge is that we need to become world-class pre-assessors and world-class formative assessors, is students must have lots of opportunities to explain towards understanding. Many times, many of you have been in a situation where you go to an exam, you take the test, and you realize, ah, I thought I knew it. So why should that happen at a summative assessment instead of a formative assessment? It should happen well before then. So I'm going to show you another brief example, just an excerpt, of a summative assessment. We asked students to produce uh, videos that explain science phenomena to younger students. We didn't really care that we were never going to give this to younger students. The challenge was producing a video to explain a phenomenon. It produces opportunities for understanding, what we call generativity. If we create more opportunities for students to understand or explain, then students will certainly understand. So here's another example. system is down the flush cellular waste goes down the flush kidneys clean blood cause they down the flush convert waste to urine cause it's down the flush ureters move urine cause they down the flush the bladder collects urine cause it's down the flush the bladder gets full you might be ready to bust you can squeeze your sphincter till you've had enough go ahead and release her down the flush Urine exits urethra, down the flush. The urinary system is down the flush. Keep the body's blood clean, cause that's what's up. I'm number one. I'm here. All right, I think, I think, I think you get the point. All right, so in, in the process of generating uh, this video, students were required to learn. All right, so I want to close today by pointing to four principles uh, to teacher education that I think we need to incorporate not only in the United States but certainly in Brazil. And the first is experience. Is tho those who do become experts at the things that they do. So we, we must move from a paradigm where students sit passively and teachers talk is we, th we need to switch. Students need to build and explain. And in the process of building and explaining, they'll develop exp explanation. They'll develop understanding. The second is, is understanding the power of explanation. Right? A question is the answer in reverse. And so we need to shift our paradigm from the teacher as expert to teacher as coach. In classrooms should be loud places where students are often explaining and arguing about why their answer is right and why the alternative should not and cannot be true. The third is immersion. If we start students earlier, I, I, I can attest to this, I run a science camp every year for young children where I give them engineering, I give them chemistry and physics, and let me tell you with 100% confidence that 100% of the young people are ecstatic about wearing a lab coat and doing real science. We have a thought process that if we're engaged in high-end science that students won't understand it, I think we're missing the point, is that immersion produces expertise. <laughs> Right? And if that's how I should learn a, a foreign language, that's certainly how I should learn science. And last, evaluation. We'll never know how well we're doing if we don't ask students along the way. And so we must shift from a paradigm of, uh, of summative assessors to a, a paradigm where students are often explaining we need to make sure the future of science education is one where we're in constant evaluation mode. So thank you for your time. It's been a joy. Muito obrigado, Brian. Uh, Brian. A gente tem, então, uns 10 minutos para perguntas uh, para o Brian, que está aqui. Vocês podem mandar por escrito ou levantar. Uh, se alguém tiver perguntas, só peço que tente ser breve para fazer pergunta para a gente poder ter mais pessoas perguntando. Eu acho que está Ah, ok. Você mencionou uh, uh, a conexão entre uh, science learning e language learning. Eu me pergunto se... We know that in language learning, there is actually a progress. There are steps. Like you can't, in German, you cannot learn end positioning before uh, accusative, for instance. And this is, this is something that applied linguists have, have really uh, defined. Is it, is it true as well in science education that, that we need to kind of follow a, a progression okay. conceptually? We'll, we'll do th three at a time. OK. okay. Obrigado. Uh, segundo, então, André.
Um, uh, I was wondering uh, if you have any suggestions to balance the vocabulary ac acquisition of uh, scientific knowledge and the communication, how to balance it in a, in a good way. Hi, Brian. Over here. Um, I was wondering if you have noticed um, any difference in the content knowledge of future teachers that's needed to implement um, this process. So do they need to understand science better, or is that really not a factor? Okay. So, so the, the first question is about developmental processes. One of the things that science education research has done very well is learning progressions. Is There are now documented uh, assessments of how students should learn a science idea. And so in the same way that they've attempted to, to map the human genome, is science education research is almost saturated with research that attempts to map the developmental process of learning science ideas. Here's the problem. That's science research, not science teaching. Yes. So All right. our understanding of how to implement those ideas. So, so for example, the curriculum is written so that the first st stage of scientific ideas is description only. So when you're in elementary school, you're introduced to, uh, to force, and, and, and you're also in introduced to ideas like momentum. But you're not asked to do the math. You're only asked to describe what happens. So description is level one, explanation is level two, and then math prediction and outcome orientation is level three. So the curriculum is written that way and has been that way for many years. So the, the answer is yes. So in reference to the second question around science language, recommendations for how do you approach it. So there is a, a limitation for cognitive capacity anyway. We cannot remember it all. Uh, actually, one of the gentlemen at Stanford, uh, former, he's a retiree, Mike Atkin, uh, he wrote an article, it's a brilliant article, it's called The Futility of Trying to Teach Everything. We cannot remember everything anyway. So the, the, the big idea of a concept is what, what starts first, and we should layer everything after. So in osmosis, the, the focus of this particular exercise is for a teacher to decide 20 years from now, what are the, what's the fundamental idea that I want students to understand? Start there, use everyday language to teach that idea, and then you explicitly give opportunities for students to use the science language towards fluency. So the argument is that we're not going to compromise whether or not students will learn all the science language. They will. But we're going to start by essentializing the big ideas first of a discipline, because those are the only ones that they are even capable of retaining. Okay. And the third question about science knowledge. I find that the teacher's knowledge is incredible. Uh, they understand the discipline in ways that I, I haven't experienced in other places. Our, our Stanford students are incredible. But that is not pedagogical content knowledge. Is understanding what a hydrogen bond is has almost no bearing on understanding what's the best way to teach it. So let me give you an example. I need to find a way for that phenomena to show up in, in the lives of students and show up regularly. So part of my job as a science teacher, I taught chemistry sometimes. So my pedagogical content knowledge, my ability to understand the idea wasn't that good. So although I understood what a hydrogen bond is, I did not understand the way, the best way to teach it until I came across a, a colleague who said, I found out something, that when rains, rainfall hits and you have curly hair or you've curled your hair, the rain has polar ends, positive and negatives, and that will break the bonds of your curly hair. It's a hydrogen bond example. Right now, I, I have a phenomenal understanding of how to teach that to people, especially young women <laughs> who curl their hair or use products on their hair. Right? Anywhere a rainy day happens, they'll remember that phenomenon. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's one thing to understand the science, and it's a whole different order to understand the science and the context of the kids' lives. And here's why. Because you weren't taught it that way. No science teacher is, is trained in learning science phenomena in context, and that's why science teaching is so difficult. And so one of the first things that we do is to teach teachers how to relearn the phenomena in the lives of their students. And, and I, as I mentioned before, if you don't live in the context or understand the culture of your students, then it becomes even more difficult. You're, you're, you're finding things that are relevant to you, and those are, those are the things that will undermine their learning ultimately. So the answer is yes, they know more, but we need to help them become students of their students and learn how the science lives in the lives of their young people. Uh, bom dia, Brian. My question is about politics. A minha dúvida é se esse método que você usa a gente poderia aplicar nas políticas do país. Então, se as comunidades podem ter um jornal diferente e assim entender mais de política e conseguir 
ter um voto mais consciente no, no país? What a wonderful question. So, I believe, this is, this is not rooted in research, that people should not ask for permission. That, particularly when it comes to science, if we want a population that is excellent in applying ideas for political purposes, then a district or a city or a county or a state should decide that that will be our calling card. We'll be a state of informed citizens, or we'll be a city of informed citizens, or we'll be a school district where we value students who understand phenomena and can apply it to politics. So that I don't appear to be a hypocrite, I want you to know that I founded, uh, I was part of a team that founded a school that is a social justice school in California, and the fundamental outcome for our students is that you can explain a science idea and how it impacts the people around you. Quick example. Instead of teaching our students about food change, we, we taught students about how unhealthy diets produce an industry of diabetes in the local context. And here's why. As they drive through their neighborhood, I want them to see uh, the Burger King or fast food restaurant, and then I also want them to see the dialysis center that ne is next to it for two reasons. One, so they understand how this impacts their lives, and two, because as we talked about earlier, knowledge is situated. They'll never forget why food chains matter because they can see its relevance. And so the answer to that question is, I think people should be empowered to do that, um, but I don't think we should ask permission. Okay, hi. So I, we don't need the translation. So I, I love the idea of the relevancy to the student and um, the cultural impact. But I'm just wondering, how do you see this scaling up? Because it's so, supposed to be so personally, and teachers are supposed to know about the student, to know the relevancy, right? How do you scale that? How do you teach teachers around the world to do this? Uh, also, a great question. It, it's one that my students are tackling. So their, their argument is that we cannot scale it up. We can help people understand what social justice instruction looks like in science education, and then give them the tools to do so. So what are the tools? So customizable textbooks are tools. So we have students who are developing uh, IDTs or uh, interactive digital textbooks. And so these are textbooks where you can drag and drop videos into place. Anything that on, is on YouTube is available to you. That you can customize assessments by keeping the content the same. And so that is a resource that provides teachers with the resources for how to do this, how to engage in relevant instruction that is relevant to the students in their room. The challenge is, how do you train teachers to be able to use the resources? And so that part is, is, is a little bit more difficult, but I think it's, it's about conversations like these where people of common mind come together to discuss ways to do it, ultimately. Okay, one. Última pergunta, Bob. Brian. I'd like to get your response to this uh, thought of mine. In Brazil, we often argue that one of the big problems in basic education, teaching, is that we're not attracting our top students, like our top secondary education students, into the higher education teaching programs. And indeed, when you compare the socioeconomic level and where students finish in their secondary program in Brazil versus other countries, we are attracting, in general, uh, students of lower economic levels and uh, lower performance in secondary education to the teaching profession. The question is whether if we go after the top students, would we be cre creating a greater divide between the culture of the professor and the culture of the student? Awesome, good question. I, I think this is actually a failure in the US educational system. There is an assumption that students who have better academic records will make better teachers. Uh, nonprofits have been established based on that principle, and they have then provided some highly educated people who have taught in underserved urban schools in ways that are crippling. Uh, so the question is, who are the people who are dedicating themselves to teaching, and are they suited to do the job at a world-class level? And so I, I know in most contexts there's a, a, a commonality to a teacher, and that a teacher's identity is in service to people 
And if, if that's not enough, I think we're, we're doomed. And so I, have a, I question the assumption around what constitutes the academic elite and their capacity to, do, to be a better teacher. Because if you're, an academically, if you're an academically elite, I believe that just meant you spent a lot of time studying and you had the, the privilege of spending a lot of time studying. Bom, eu queria, então, com essa última pergunta, encerrar essa manhã uh, de, que a gente falou sobre ciências, uh, agradecer muito o, o Brian Brown, e só dizer que uh, a gente espera que esse seja o, o começo de um diálogo com pessoas, instituições, pesquisadores no Brasil sobre o ensino de ciências, e que eu e todos os panelistas e o Brian, a gente está à disposição para conversar sobre todas essas coisas e para tentar fazer que, que o, o ensino de ciências no Brasil seja um dos melhores do mundo, porque não tem nenhuma razão para que a gente não faça isso acontecer. Então, muito obrigado. Thank you, Brian. E thank you, all the panelists.